and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. The man behind the Perilous D6 engine, as well as its flagship, Streets of Peril, now coming back, now coming back with a properly funded expansion and, and setting in the form of Storms over, in, for, in form of S O, not S O P, Storms over um, Sturmberg. Sorry, the one and only Cal Griswold. How are you doing today, man? I am well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on, and th and thank you for eating all of the crow because I had to pick on you ab about the fact that it <laughs> for a bit of context, ev everyone, when this was early on in his ki in his Kickstarter, I had a I had approached Kyle about coming back to talk about it. A little ways into it, he's he was like, "Nah, nah, don't bother. This isn't gonna make it." And lo and behold, a couple weeks later. It ends up making it. Thankfully. So I d so I did a follow up say saying, "Would you would you like to schedule that?" And yeah, I um, I uh, I wasn't I wasn't really sure. Uh, you know, when I did the first Kickstarter for Straight Shoots of Peril, the game funded in less than a day, uh, and so. Uh, I, I kind of just assumed this one wasn't going to work out, and part of it was my fault because um, I try to cut corners on marketing uh, because the first one did cost a ton of money to actually do all the advertisement. And so, I, lesson learned: next time I do one of these uh, crowdfunding campaigns, I'm actually I'm not going to skimp out on the on the advertisement. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we this is. You're no stranger to the temple. The first time I had you on was in the early incarnations of Streets of Peril when it seemed like it was going to be leaning into the system used by the world's most litigious role playing game. Then of course <laughs> the incident then of course the incident last January happened and you ended up pivoting towards a D six system, though it, from what I, from what I recall you were kind of pivoting towards that anyways. The fiasco just accelerated things. Yeah, in fact, uh, the initial uh, rule book that had been released, I think the, or the first one was actually printed in 2021. So the game had already been out for a while. Uh, and so that was just, it, it ultimately, it just made me relieved that things resolved, uh, that I made the choice that I did. And then it also made me reconsider potentially opening up the setting to other systems. And of course, of course, that led to Perilous D six, and the rest is history. Correct. Now, as I understand it, Storms of Over Sturmberg, which is the first full supplement, is intended to be a um, location sandbox, specifically the the city of St the city of Sturmberg and its surrounding areas. Correct. Yeah. So it's it's primarily, like you said, it's a good descriptor. Is uh, it's a sandbox setting. So uh, there is a there's an included adventure. It's short, uh, and it's mostly just to kind of give you a little bit of a, a feel for the the kind of some of the factions that exist inside the city. But for the most part, it is intended to be used by the game master as an open resource, which can be um, they can go to frequently to consult and use in a variety of different ways. Yeah. Now, moving on from that, what sort of city is Sturmberg? Since this is this is the first proper um, this is the first proper setting ex setting expansion to Streets of Peril up the closest thing to setting build up, build up before this was like cha like um, chapter 6 in the core book which was just a brief, just a brief gazetteer on the Cimbrian Empire. Yeah, and so uh, and Sternberg is also briefly mentioned in the the rule book, like you like you mentioned in the gazetteer. 
And uh, the included adventure in Streets of Peril, Finkelstein's Laboratory, is also set in Sternberg as well. So uh, there was a lot of, um, a little bit of, uh, I touched on the city a little bit in the original book before eventually creating the whole um, supplement for it. And so the, I think something to consider when you're asking what kind of city is it is that you have to understand it within the context of the empire that it exists within. Uh, so the Cimbrian Empire is very much um, uh, inspired by the Holy Roman Empire around the 16th century. Uh, or, um, you know, I think another, you know, the Hanseatic League, which is probably maybe even closer to this kind of loose confederation of uh, cities. And... Um, the Cimbrian Empire collectively is pretty xenophobic. Um, they're pretty wary of outsiders. And I would say that Sturmberg, by comparison, is pretty progressive. It's progressive for um, Cimbrian standards, meaning that they, and that's predominantly because of the fact that they are an, an incredibly important trading hub. They're the largest port city in the empire. And so they have frequent contact with a lot of foreign cultures there. And a lot, as a result of that, a lot of the, the citizens have to be uh, fairly uh, fluent in a variety of different languages, at least the common languages uh, that merchants hail, would be speaking. Uh, and then, like I said, because it's a coastal city, uh, a lot of the culture is very much influenced by the maritime industries which uh, drive the economy. Mm -hmm. And... I will I will note since you brought up the Holy Holy Roman Empire, um, I've I've sometimes called that the 17th century toll, um, toll booth, because simply because of the sheer amount of different territories that made that made it up. Um, yeah, it, for sure. And uh, when you're talking about the Holy Roman Empire, even within a given century. Uh, there, there's quite a bit of inconsistency throughout the empire, um, and and culturally it changes quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why I said uh, I think I think if I had to, to to identify a historical equivalent, I think probably the Hanseatic League is probably the yeah. the closest because at this point in the world, yeah, there is an emperor, emperor, there is a central government, but they don't really hold as much influence as they used to. Most of the city-states are nearly sovereign. It, it's it's almost a kind of a, a loose confederation of cities. Yeah. And... Just, and, um, when it comes to... When it comes to the sheer amount of territories within the Holy Roman Empire, um, on a whim, I decided to to see if I can find a decent, ma a decent um, political map instead of a geographical map for that region. Um... This was one that I found. This is intended to be the whole, the Holy Roman Empire circa 1356. <laughs> Just look at uh, all that in the middle. Yes. Yeah, and and I would say um, most of at least technologically, uh, the Cimbrian Empire is probably close to mid 16th century. Uh, so you're you're you know, you're you're talking about um, you know the probably the height of uh, the use of launch connects uh, maybe uh, maybe a little earlier maybe late into the reign of Maximilian the first. Mm -hmm. um, the be I think I think one of the best analogies to use is don't bother attacking us we've got that covered. <laughs> Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting, too, because, you know, around this time period, you're starting to see um, a transition from feudal armies to uh, more professional armies. Uh, but these are, you know, these professional armies are, are fairly different than the way that we would think of them now. I mean, a lot of a lot of these are, in some ways, either absolutely mercenaries or pretty close to what we would think of as mercenaries. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you, at any given time, I mean, one of the, one of the problems is that when there is no war, uh, soldiers with no work uh, often cause problems. Uh, and so you, you kind of almost want to, 
get all of the uh, fighting men in your country sent outside of the country at any given time just so that they don't cause problems. Remember, folks, teamwork is essential. It gives people other things to shoot at. <laughs> Correct. That, but would you? But if that um. Now, St now, Sternberg is meant to be a co is meant to be a coastal city, meant to, and I'm get I'm guessing that's part of the reason why it's a little bit more. It's prog progressive is the isn't the best word. Tolerant. <laughs> Is the closest it's thing it, it's uh it's progressive it, yeah, it's progressive in the traditional use of the word not in the modern american uh term yeah so uh yeah they're just they're uh they're they're a little less xenophobic they and just because they have more exposure to outside cultures that, um, i'm guessing that sternberg is a bit of a trading hub yeah, absolutely. It's a huge trading hub. And then on, on top of that, um, its proximity to the Brithonian Isles uh, means that they have a, a lot more contact with that civilization up to the north. Uh, and then on, and then furthermore, uh, they are just, they're in, like I said, they're, they're in contact with a lot of people um, from around the world that the rest of the empire, which is landlocked, uh, simply doesn't. Now, with, now e even with that, I'm, it's not just Sternberg that's going to be the focus of this book, as I understand it, but also some of the area surrounding the, sit the city in and of itself. Yeah, correct. And so, you know, I, I think one of the important things when we're looking at um, a setting is not just... Uh, this you know the uh, the country or the city itself, uh, but uh, the neighboring regions, uh, neighboring cities. Uh, what's the environment? Because obviously there's going to be some influence there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in the in this book, uh, I touch on, I add some, so I expand on some more locations uh, which aren't covered in the core rulebook. So like. Uh, there are two more cities uh, which are briefly mentioned. Uh, one's called Bomheim. It's to the west. It's just north of the Dunkelwald, uh, and they have they're um, I, I they're kind of like a, they have a very they're almost a protectorate of Sternberg. Is in fact in so much that Sternberg holds a lot of influence and sway over the cities. It's a much smaller city, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Bomheim's primary influence is um, uh, lumber. And the Dunkelwald, uh, the Dunkelwald is uh, kind of notorious for having this rare ironwood, which is used to in uh, to build imperial ships. Uh, but the the force is also uh, relatively infamous for being really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so you get some adventure kind of seeds that you can plant there, as far as the fact that um, you know witch fighters are are constantly going in and not coming out. The city itself of Bomheim, which again is, has this kind of very intimate relationship with Sternberg, uh, is considered to be kind of a cursed city. And um, and then to the south of Sternberg, I um, I have a new uh, location called the Hockblau Marsh, um, and it runs kind of along the the Teuton River and the Geist Road. And in there, uh, you get some opportunities to have. Um, your Fomorians. So, uh, you know, I, I taught, I touch on Fomorians in the core rule book a little bit, but in this, um, kind of swampy marsh area, uh, there are some really interesting opportunities here for exploring the ruins of some ancient civilizations, whether they be Elven or Fomorian. And there are in fact, Fomorians still roaming in that area. Uh, and then there's all of the, um, protectorate, um, lands to the southeast which is called hertha's basket and it's this uh very rich uh farming land which uh, is directly under sternberg's control uh and and one of the things that's really interesting i talk about in the core rule book is how you know traditionally in the empire it would have been divided by baronies and so these barons would have owned large swaths of land uh, but in the modern empire either um the lands within the empire are either just contested where you've got a dozen people claiming ownership of it, or 
Uh, they are essentially controlled by these large city-states in much the same way that barons would in the past. And then um, to the northeast, there's a city called Sturstadt, uh, which is a direct rival of Sternberg, and I go into all the history between the two. Uh, and so some really interesting things that you can play off with that as far as like if you wanted to run a privateer campaign because both cities employ privateers to harass one another. And then uh, there's a chain of islands uh, just north of the city called the Panese Islands. And they're kind of interesting because uh, there's a there's a lineage um, in the Coroba called the Valentini. And... Uh, they are the descendants of the Tiberian Republic, which is essentially Rome. Well, these uh, the occupants um, of the Panese Islands, uh, they uh, they are they still identify as being Tiberian. They're probably the last like bastion of what is was the Tiberian Republic, uh, and so there's some really interesting things that uh, game masters can explore with that as well. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in mind, of, co of, of course, the focus is going to be on the city, and I'm, I think I think one of the big things to go into is how 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 large would you say the city is? Not in a population sense, but in a is it is it big enough to have its own sec to have its own sections, much like how there's the different boroughs of New York City, for instance. Yes. In fact, I go into uh, significant detail dividing the city into districts. Um, I think, if I'm looking at the map, there's about seven main districts or so in the city. Um, and then, so I have a, a large city map, which details the entire city. And then I break down the map into portions. And then I show where all of the various little individual locations in each district are. I provide... Um, a description of like what is this building, what is this location. I, I sometimes I'll provide also NPCs which are related to that location. And then the one thing that I I really wanted to do instead of just um, providing information for the sake of information, almost all of the locations uh, have an adventure seat tied to it. So uh, the game master is provided um, with some potential kind of plot hooks that they can put, that they can use at any time. Uh, because one of the things that I'm, I personally is, is I'm a really, is really important to me is that in a campaign, uh, there are a variety of different adventuring paths available to the, the players at any given time. Mm -hmm. And with this book, uh, there is just, there's countless things that the players can explore. Uh, and then they have all these different, uh, options, which they can weigh. Now, with that in, with that in mind, one of the one of the, obviously one of the big things when dealing with a sit with with a city or with or with some sort of um, sandbox with a settlement is of course factions, and there's a few that you do ha you do have. Some of them are detailed in the in the um, Kickstarter, and some of them are going to be in the are going to be in the full book. Um, Within e within each of them, I am curious if you have if you have a bit of an aside for each on how th how each faction sees each other as far as who they are indifferent towards, who they are friendly with, who they are shoot on sight with. Yeah. So the way the factions are broken down uh, is you. Um, I think every faction. Uh, is provided with one or more significant uh, NPCs. And then uh, they are further broken down to alliances and rivalries. So every faction, you'll have a, a, a blurb about who are the um, potential allies uh, that that faction has. And then you'll also get a whole other segment about who are the rivals that they have. Uh, some uh, factions will have um, other details as well. Uh, depending on um, if there are something that is uh, significant to them that would not be significant to other factions. So like uh, one of the quote unquote noble houses, uh, House Ziegler, uh, they are in this section of the city, which was destroyed by a comet. And then, and everything in this area has been corrupted by this, um, this meteor. Mm -hmm. 
I guess. And so they are a house of mutants, but they don't think they're mutants. They, they, they absolutely keep conducting themselves like knights and retainers and bards. Uh, and, uh, in that in their section, one of the things that I go into is talking about this cult of the Star Mother. And the Star Mother is is, is also described in the Streets of Peril Core rulebook. And um, and so I kind of go a little bit extra detail with that faction as to okay, why how is this um, how is this uh, noble house embrace this cult? What you know you know despite the fact that these um, mutants don't actually think of themselves as mutants. You know, how do they perceive the all of these cultists from the Star Mother who have started flocking to them? Uh, and so, things like of that nature is is the kind of how I break down all the various factions. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that said, one obviously one of the bigger pillars with the book is going to be maritime adventure. And obviously, that obviously that's leaning a little bit into shipbuilding. So, how a lot of games have had shipbuilding and had ship combat, especially games that th that are themed around swashbuckling. But some of them can get a little bit crunchy, and the Perilous D6 system is is I'd say crunch medium. So, how yeah. do you maintain both ship creation and ship to ship combat? Especially when you're dealing with fleets, while maintaining that e that ease of use. I, that's an awesome question. So, uh, the way ships work, uh, I have nine classes of ships: um, cog, galliot, dow, galley, caravel, the galleus, the galley, and the carrick, and the great ship. Um, and <clears throat> they are either these sh the, the ship classes are either kind of bordering late medieval, like in the case of the cog, or um, kind of very late Renaissance, like with uh, the case of the Galleon, where we're almost looking at late, late 16th century, early 17th century. Uh, so uh, the characters, uh, so you, the party can purchase a ship, and then all of the ships are fully detailed with um, all the various different uh, stats that they have, whether it be the size of it, um, how many uh, fighting crew members would be aboard of it, how much damage the hull can take, how much, you know, how many big guns are on the ship. Uh, but then uh, the the players can also customize ships um, by upgrading them in various ways. So there's a, there are these ship special traits, and that can be something like an armored crew where they basically buy an, an armory of uh, munitions uh, armor on the, on the shoes, on the ship. Uh, or it could be something more complicated like, uh, having the race built special trait. So this is something that's exclusive to the galleon where it becomes uh, faster and more maneuverable. Uh, so that's how they can basically, they basically, they have a, a chassis, which is um, just described with its basic stats. And then with, through the use of purchasing these upgrades and these uh, uh, special traits, they can customize their ships how they want. Uh, the so the actual rules themselves, how to keep it uh, kind of cr uh, medium crunch, because I think that's actually the the perfect way to describe Perilous D six, uh, was actually super difficult. Uh, when I first came up with the first rendition of the uh, naval engagement rules, I originally had everything on a grid, like uh, the way that the standard combat is done in um, Perilous D six. Uh, but and we had play tested that for a while. We play tested that for about a year. Um, and while I think it was fun, uh, there was a couple of things that I that um, issues that came up. One being, uh, you uh, you know, while we had this cool uh, map with uh, you know with little miniature boats, that's probably not something that everyone's going to want to do. Uh, and then the other big thing is the combat ended up taking a lot longer than combat normally takes in Perils D6, which is, that was the big issue. Uh, because, you know, one of the things that I, I, uh, I am really proud of with the original Perils D6 combat rules is that most combats are resolved very quickly. And so uh, the rules for naval engagements uh, that are provided in storms are uh, much more their theater of the mind. I, and 
In fact, one of the things that I uh, was sort of inspired me when I was thinking about how to revise the rules to make them a little bit more uh, to be resolved more quickly and not having to have as much uh, visual aids mm -hmm. uh, was uh, looking at how um, Shadow Dark was using uh, their ranges. And I can't remember the exact terminology it's used, but basically it's something like, are you close to your target or are you far away from your target? Um, and so the uh, the way that the, the maritime... Uh, naval engagement rules work is they are they're very much suited to theater of the mind um and they can they can be resolved very quickly because you don't have to uh think about how your ship is perfectly pivoting and how far it can move which is fun like i said i read that's how we originally had it in the rule set uh but i think the the way that the rules are now is they they're going to be much easier to use they're going to be the, the combats are going to be resolved much quicker uh, and then uh, one of the other things that I, I thought was really important that I really wanted to make sure was implemented was that uh, the characters have some influence over the engagement um, beyond just what the ship's own, uh, own capabilities are. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there are there's some really interesting ways in which characters with ranks in uh, row sail or orientation or shooting or fighting um, or leadership, how they can influence the engagement um, more or less, depending on how skilled they are in one of those different skills. Mm -hmm. So, I and I'm I'm guess I'm guessing e even when it comes to the bigger monsters that you have that are that are clearly meant to be going up against ships, it's still going to be that same. The, that theater of the mind setup, but that brings another potential issue, um, and that it that it you mentioned the, you mentioned character input, so some game I've seen some games handle ship combat as as if each um, individual ship is a character, and some where the ship is ha is handled by the party. Um, in the case of the in the case of the former, that's relatively easy to do. <laughs> you know, just a ship with its, own, with its own sheet or something like that. In the case of the latter, where the party has that one ship, um, how do you manage that within Perilous D6? Oh. Sorry about that. I think my mic cut out. <laughs> oh, okay, good. I was wondering if that was on my end. No. What I was asking is how how do you handle the how do you handle ship combat in this in the sense where the party has that one ship instead of maintaining a fleet? Ah, uh, okay. Y yeah. So um, that's simple. If there's one ship and everything's being resolved on the deck of a ship, uh, you're just going to use the the rules which are in um, Streets of Pearl. Uh, and everything within Streets of Peril can handle anything that you're going to to come across, whether it be um, having to use uh, athletics checks to navigate uh, difficult terrain or climbing up ropes or um, anything like that or being overwhelmed or everything else. Mm -hmm. The Now that now... That brings me to the character option end of things, and you do have you do have a few a, a few new um, subclasses. I'm guessing that when it, that there's going to be no new classes per se in Storms Over Sternberg, just new subclasses. So, if you don't mind, I'd like to go through the um, the classes that were in um, Streets of Peril and and ask which um which ones are getting new subclasses and which ones aren't. Oh. Yeah, so there are yeah, there's three new subclasses. Mm -hmm. uh, scoundrel, Brute, and Duelist are getting one of them. So for the Scoundrel, there'll be the Pirate subclass. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the Brute will have the Reaver subclass, which is um, very much tied into the setting. Um, most of the Reavers are like 
you know, so, so for context, the Brythonians are kind of a um, uh, Irish, Norse, uh, maybe a kind of Gaelic Norse uh, culture. You could even think of them maybe as like uh, the Scots um, occupied by the the Norse. And so um, there, there are these, uh, they have these reavers, and uh, most of them worship Dagadol, this evil deity of, of the sea. And so they're kind of like these uh, Renaissance Vikings in a sense. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other one, the duelist gets the school of the sea serpent, uh, which is uh, this um, very mobile uh, subclass, which has access to poison. And you also there is also mention of um, div of new divine patrons, as well as new, as well as new spells. Now, obviously, going into all, all of the new spells would be a would be a lengthy affair. So, when it comes to divine pa when it comes to divine patrons, what can you tell me about what's getting added on that front? Yeah, so there are uh, three uh, patrons which I think are are very important to the setting, and so I went to a lot of detail not just giving mechanical um, explanations to how they would work if you're playing a cultist, uh, but actually going into detail as far as like, what is the history of that um, divine being? Uh, what are their ambitions within Sternberg? What are their tenets or symbols? Um, and then each one of them has um, uh, their own set of miracles, which if you're playing a cultist, you'll have access to. And then, all the patron abilities that cultists get when declaring a patron. So the three that are in there, um, and I, yeah, all three of them are briefly mentioned in Streets of Peril and then elaborating more detail. So the first one's Dagadol. Um, he's the Endless Hunger. He is, that. they're instead of like, you know, in most, uh, I think, fantasy settings, there are a bunch of different uh, uh, maritime deities and you'll may you'll maybe have like an umberly who's like the manifestation of storms and dread and then you'll have you know um some sort of more positive uh, maritime deities and there's probably a bunch of them and they all have different uh different little subcategories which they have dominion over in the case of uh streets of peril uh, I really, really, really wanted to channel this kind of idea of, of the sea being inherently uh, a, a place of peril and danger. And so there is only one uh, true lord of the sea, and that is Dagadol. Uh, and he is this, um, he is very much a Lovecraftian being. He is, uh, he is a great old one. Uh, he is um, kind of a, a strange uh entity and so much that instead uh i, I didn't I, I wanted to have uh i wanted to explain him in such a way that could be somewhat comprehensible to the reader and so so much that like uh he is he is a he has a voracious appetite he is he desires for the sea to be filled with blood mm. uh and so much so that um he doesn't even care if his his followers, his cultists, and his worshippers uh, murder one another. In fact, he rejoices in that. Just as long as the sea is being filled with blood, he's happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in fact, the one of the factions within Sternberg, um, House Steiner, um, who which has now been infiltrated by this um, this cult of Dagadol, their uh, their uh, matriarch, she. Um, well, despite the fact that she has this whole cult of very loyal worshippers, who were, she's not entirely certain what, exactly what Dagadol wants, because this is a mind of a great old one, and is his what exactly he wants is sort of uh, uh, unfathomable uh, beyond the fact that she all she knows is that he wants the city to be uh, basically filled with blood and flowing into the sea, uh, and so that's kind of the the idea of Dagadol. Um, and then uh, there's the Star Mother. And the Star Mother is interesting because uh, she is uh, the creator of um, the elves. And uh, the uh, what's interesting is the elves are so very different than everything else uh, that the Star Mother has created and loves. So the elves are this huge mistake in her eyes because... Uh, there is almost no 
uh, inconsistency. They're all, they're very kind of uh, they're they're kind of a, a very cookie cutter template. They also the elves are a, a huge mistake in the fact that they they're incapable of creating progeny. They they there's no way for elves to create more elves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, with all that in mind, uh, the the star mother is essentially abandons them. Uh, but what she's really interested in is the creating of novel life. She loves the novelty, um, and so because of that, she is, the most of the the kind of the worshippers who flock to her are mutants. Uh, which see their um, abnormal uh, physical traits as being a gift from her, and she does that, that as uh, sees them as well. In fact, she she's very fond of mutants because of are so very fond of humans because uh, human flesh is so easily corrupted. And uh, so uh, within Sturmberg, one of the reasons why Star Mother is important, without giving too much away is that um, obviously there's this um, meteor, which crashes in the city. And there's like, I, I touched on earlier, there is this whole segment of the city, which is, is kind of one of this corrupting influence. And so, um, and then on top of it, the, uh, those who are coming to the city, some of the mutants who are flocking to the city believe that this, um, the celestial body, which crashed into the city is actually, um, the vehicle which brought the star mother to the world. Uh, so that's why she's important. Uh, and then as you can imagine, all of the miracles and everything surrounding about her are uh, very much um, transfiguring your flesh in various ways, whether it's creating a ripping a, a, a sword out of, made out of bone from your own flesh or twisting and mixing your flesh or creating elixirs, which do things uh, to the body. Mm-hmm. And then the final de- uh, deity, uh, which is actually not a deity. In fact, I, I, the, all three of these are sort of hard to to pin as being a traditional deity in, in, in the, as far as the way in which the world term uh, the terminology is used for gods. Because um, uh, Dagadol's this alien old one, um, which is really not from this this plane. Uh, the Star Mother is something similar, and, and in the case of Thraxus, the Blood Serpent, he's a demon prince, and he's one of the most powerful demon princes. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, before Sturmberg uh, was as we, as it is now in modernity, uh, you know, it had existed as a variety of different civilizations. Um, at one point, when the elves had occupied the area, it was Belglace, and then following that, it was Carpinia when the Tiberians had occupied it. And during the time when the Tiberians occupied this region, uh, there were uh, several uh, secret uh, cults to Thraxus where they had built these um, subterranean temples, these huge snake temples to him. Uh, And um, unfortunately, uh, when the uh, kind of barbaric Cimbrians first initially started destroying uh, the Tiberian Republic in the north, uh this all of the uh the kind of the cult uh that worshiped thraxis was similarly sort of dismantled and now in modern times um thraxis is is sending out um cultists to try to reclaim these um subterranean temples which are located beneath the city and he's he's your snake god um the the his followers uh, start to take on uh, reptilian attributes. They actually eventually will completely shed their human skin uh, in favor of a new reptilian form, and they're cannibals, and they perform ritualistic cannibalism where they eat uh, human flesh, uh, and then they have all kinds of um, miracles related to things like summoning vipers and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I'm, gu- I'm guessing that because of the whole patron thing with the cultist oh, class that each of these is going to have their own um, benefit if you choose one of them as the divine patron. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so like if you're a, um, a cultist of Dagadol, um, you can breathe underwater and then you also get things like natural weapons because you, 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 your, your mouth basically gets replaced with shark teeth. Uh, But then you're also a mutant, so you have penalties to diplomacy checks. And then with the Star Mother, um, uh, again, you're a mutant once again, um, um, but your mind has been so thoroughly corrupted 
uh, that you are, uh, you're immune to being demoralized or frightened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in the case of Thraxis, um, again, kind of the same theme, like your body is, is being corrupted and mutated, but, and, but as a consequence of that, you get things like you have scaly flesh, so you get a bonus to your armor rolls. Um, and you also get natural weapons, uh, which um, are inherently poisoned, or I should say venomous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And since you're since you're dealing with expanding the the equipment list, I'm I'm guessing that the possibility of utilizing full sized um, cannons is one option that's being presented with, especially with the whole ship combat aspect. You know, I outside of uh, naval engagements, I did not include any new rules for artillery. And I think that's probably something that will show up in um, one of the uh, uh, Blazing Citadel issues. So I have uh, right now on my Patreon, anyone who's interested in uh, Streets of Peril or anything else that's related to Perilous D6, uh, I have this uh, monthly zine that just that is access to the Patreon, and I come up with uh, I introduce new lore and new rules and different kinds of things. Uh, and I think probably what I'll do there is um, introduce some rules for artillery, like maybe culverins and things like that. I think one of the one of the issues with employing artillery outside of uh, a battle or a naval engagement is um, basically, I mean, if a humanoid figure gets hit with uh, most uh, of these artillery pieces, if there's, there's not a whole lot of mechanical things that need to be done. It's probably just going to die. Mm-hmm. You know, because, because you've been hit with a damn cannon, you're, you're not, you're, um, your descriptions are now was slash were. Yeah. And, um, I think, so, you know, one of the things I'm going to be doing, I'm working on another game, which is right now entitled, um, and, and I'm going to be, I have a whole, uh, a whole bunch of, uh, rules that are going to be included for running armies, um, like full battles. Mm-hmm. And so if some, with something like that, uh, then I could definitely see artillery being used. It's the same way that naval engagements, you know, you need to have rules for how cannons work because obviously they make sense in that context. But I would say that for the, you know, traditional adventure, you know, TTRPG adventuring party, uh, it, I think it really all, the only role that really needs to come down to is determining whether or not the artillery actually misses or hits the target. And if it hits, I mean, I don't know that you really need to roll out dice. I mean, if um, yeah, even uh, some sort of crappy Renaissance, uh, early Renaissance, late medieval um, bombard or something like that's going to just absolutely just destroy whatever it hits, you know. <laughs> so uh, I don't know that you need a lot of mechanical rules for that. Yeah. Oh. Even even so, there there were certain types of weapons that were more optimized for. You know, com- combat aboard a ship. Obviously, you're not going to be bringing a great sword, a great sword when raiding a a vessel. So I'm guessing you do have some some um, equipment to de- to cover that. So it's actually really interesting you say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, great swords were, were actually used during this time. So uh, the Battle of Lepanto is a really interesting example of 16th century warfare. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, all the weapons that are included in Streets of Peril are the same weapons which would have been used. Uh, you'll see that in that battle, the Italians and Spaniards um, are intermittently using these really large war swords uh, on the decks of the ships. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the flagships in the uh, the European Navy, uh, which is uh, has a bunch of knights on it, uh, several of the knights are described as using giant war swords on the ship. Um, and so, and then on top of it, I mean, 16th century naval warfare is really interesting, especially in the Mediterranean, uh, where you're, you're, you know, you're seeing galleys, uh, essentially just setting up, uh, melee combat. They're, they're, they're ramming one another so that the, the, the crews can fight against each other. Mm. Uh, and you know, you're looking at, um, uh, fully armored soldiers or, or very nearly, uh, fully armored soldiers. Using things like shields and swords, 
um, uh, pole arms, uh, great swords. Uh, the the sort of fighting that would have been occurring uh, w- was not really resolved with uh, large guns in the way that we traditionally think. Uh, now it, that changes depending on the theater. Like in um, Northern Europe, uh, especially uh, when we when we think in the terms of like um, the way that the the English navies are starting to change. Uh, we start to see, uh, like, for example, I think what a lot of people think around this time period, um, the conflict between the Tudor Navy and the Spanish Armada really comes to mind. And, you know, the only reason, or maybe not the only reason, but one of the significant reasons why um, that resolved the way the way that it did is that the English Navy absolutely could not afford to engage the Spanish in the way uh, that the Battle of Lepanto resolved. They didn't have enough soldiers on their ships. Uh, the Spanish would have absolutely just decimated the English crews mm-hmm. uh, because they were they were they had a lot of fighting men on their ships. So the English were um, absolutely had to deploy the kind of tactics that they used uh, using their uh, race built galleons to essentially uh, outmaneuver the Spanish ships um, and uh, just sort of kind of harass and pepper them with gunfire from afar which is again that's kind of the way in which i think most modern people think of naval combat in that period but in reality again depending on the theater i mean especially if we're looking at the mediterranean most of the combat is is essentially a renaissance uh field battle just being conducted on the deck of a ship or several ships Mm -hmm. so with so with that in mind um, give, uh, given given how things ended up go ended up um, going, and congratulations on getting um sixty on um, sixty two hundred bucks in um funding when you were originally asking for five thousand, which um was was certainly the comeback kid story kid story as I mentioned before, but. What are you shooting for as far as a page count is concerned? Yeah, so uh, originally the um, I was going to have uh, you know I was going to expand the book quite a bit, uh, but right now I'm just going to keep it because I I, I kind of hit the basic bear goal. Uh, you're looking at 96 pages for the final product. Mm-hmm. Uh, one one of the things though, and this is something that. Um, is consistent with everything that I do, including Streets of Peril, is that, like, Streets of Peril originally was written with, like, I think 140 pages, and then ended up in its last printing with 165. 178. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, Streets of all the things that I do are, uh, there's just no nonsense. I don't don't have any wasted content in anything that I write. Um, You know, I know that, around the time when I first started writing these books, the, the norm was like books with like 400 pages. Um, and I would buy them and I'd be like, this is a lot of this is just, uh, stuff. I'm not going to, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything that's kind of, you know, uh, disparaging, but it was a lot of content I wouldn't use. And because it was in the book, it made the book kind of unwieldy and difficult to use. Uh, so I will say this, even though the book's at 96 pages, if you go and you pull some of your older RPG books, it's, it's the same length as a lot of those. And every single page in this book, at, there's, there is no wasted content. Everything in this book is valuable. And I, I, you, I will absolutely refund. If anyone gets this Kickstarter and they think this book isn't, isn't worth the money they spent, I will absolutely refund them. It is, it, every single page is, is valuable. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it develops. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window now that the Kickstarter is finished? Yeah. So okay, good, great, great question. So right now, the uh, my editor just finished um, the first uh, edits last night. Um, my I have one piece of art still outstanding, and um, Ashia is working on that right now. Uh, so really is, and, and all the writing's done. So I was well, soon as the Kickstarter resolves, which I think, you know, it takes two weeks for them to, for Kickstarter to collect all the money. Uh, so I think probably around next, I think it's next Monday. Um, I'm going to start sending out the surveys, uh, and, uh, from backer kit. And then once the backer kit gets resolved, 
Uh, everyone will get uh, access to the PDFs right away. So if you got the bundle, you're going to get your Streets of Peril uh, PDF. You're going to get your um, uh, Storms over Sternberg PDF right away. The Storms over Sternberg PDF that you get uh, right away uh, may not be entirely uh, the same as the final product, only because um, I myself I've had two editors and myself go through these books. And I, I can go through the book. I'll read the book a hundred times and I'll keep finding stuff. Uh, and the same thing with these professional editors. So um, I, I will like, it's a, it's a finished product in the sense that like, I mean, you're going to get, you're going to get it right away, which I, I'm a very, that's something that's very important to me when it comes to crowdfunding. Um, I don't want to collect money for the game until the game's basically done or whatever product I'm making is basically done. Um but I also really want to make sure that before this goes to print, because we are going to be doing offset printing, uh, you only get one chance to do it, uh, that uh, the editing is as good as I can get it realistically before it goes to print. And so those those books, will the printing time, so I would say probably once everyone gets their initial PDFs, I'm going to probably spend another few weeks, maybe up to a month, just really going over everything again. Uh, to just make sure, scrutinize it and, and just go through the edits. Uh, and then I'll send it to print. And then uh, Print Ninja usually takes about um, three months from start to finish for the books to arrive from China to here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I will ship the books out right away from there. And then, you know, I think um, I was just looking at the because I'm doing my taxes. I was just looking at all the, the shipping and everything from last year when I did the Storms over Sturmber or uh, Streets of Peril campaign. And I want to say that uh, everyone received the final book within approximately four months of the campaign's conclusion, which I think is, for a Kickstarter, is, is pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I'll be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And <laughs> yes, thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right, cheers, everyone. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!